Hello, I am Leslie Tuttle from the uh, Louisiana State University, and I'd like to welcome you to session 4B, Painting, History, and Constructions of Cultural Identity in Early Modern France. I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Lynn Wood Mollenauer is Associate Professor and Chair of the History Department of the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She earned her BA in History and Fine Arts cum laude at Amherst College and a PhD from Northwestern University. She is the author of Strange Revelations, Magic, Poison, and Sacrilege in Louis XIV's France, published in Penn State University's Excellent Magic and History series. She is the author of numerous articles on religion, medicine, and magic in the early modern world, and her current book project explores the construction and transmission of medical knowledge, practice, and goods in 17th century France. Her paper today is titled Femme Forte and Femme Fatale, Posing en Cléopâtre in the Ancien Régime. Uh, so I'd like to apologize in advance for any technical difficulties that I will be having with a microphone and a PowerPoint that's a little ways away. Um, prepare for some excitement, not just in the paper. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, this is a paper that uh, came out of a History of Medicine project, which I know might not make much sense when you uh, look at this here, but I, I'm looking at a lapidary medicine. And as I was working on pearl medicines, uh, which are ground up pearls that are made into a julep that help with um, one's unsettled stomach and uh, their calcium carbonate, so that makes some kind of sense. What I found is I was coming up with all sorts of portraits of aristocratic women posing as Cleopatra, right, holding a pearl over a cup, and I, I had no idea what to make of them. So in the spirit of Halloween, uh, I decided to uh, look at this for this conference um, uh, uh, today. So. Uh, Louis XIV might be the um, most recognizable of figures to pose in the guise of a classical god, but he was far from unique in doing so. I mean, throughout the Ancien Regime, French royals and nobles alike commissioned portraits in which they were depicted as ancient gods and mythical heroes. Paintings of uh, on Oh, there it goes, I knew it. Um, of Henri IV show him posing as uh, Hercules, defeating the Hydra. Those of the Grand Mademoiselle represent her as Minerva. Uh, the Chevalier de Lorraine um, selected Ganymede as his model, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, and portraits of uh, Louis XIV's mistress, Madame de Montespan, depict her as Venus. So by the start of the 17th century, nobles also represented themselves in the guise of historical heroes and heroines, as hommes illustres and uh, femmes fortes. And the images of the illustrious and the generous and the strong, which appeared in both literary and artistic form, were meant to inspire readers and viewers by exemplifying heroic ideals and personifying the Christian virtues. As Louis XIV explained in his memoir, um, the example of the hommes illustres and their singular actions furnished by antiquity provide needed inspiration as much for affairs of war and affairs of peace as affairs of peace. Now, portraits of the hommes illustres typically extolled the exploits of both Theseus or Achilles or Alexander the Great. Louis XIV frequently had himself represented as Alexander. Um, oh, those were, that's, I'm jumping ahead. Um, uh, and one of his legitimated sons was named after Alexander as well. Uh, women, uh, right, or, sorry, those are the, the um, portraits of the, of the femme forte celebrated the mothers of heroes, um, Olympia, mother of Alexander the Great, uh, or perhaps wives of extraordinary virtue such as Penelope. Now, queen regents might choose more martial models. Um, Catherine and Marie de Medici, for example, um, both commissioned portraits of themselves as Artemisia of um, Caria, the widowed queen who commanded a fleet during the, the Persian Wars. Uh, now, by the middle of the 17th century, I've got a few more femme forts for you. Um, uh, the femme forte appeared frequently in literary and artistic form. And the most well-known of these is perhaps Pierre Lemoyne's Galerie de Femme Forte. Um, dedicated to Anne of Austria in the first years of her regency. 
And the work contains engravings and essays lauding the fortitude of a score of uh, heroic women uh, throughout history, um, including Judith and Lucretia and Joan of Arc. But one of the most fashionable of painted um, for during the Ancien Regime was neither a model of wifely fidelity or battlefield bravery, but rather one who was far more often associated during the 17th century, 17th century with sensuality and extravagance. Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, so what I'd like to consider today is how Cleopatra came to be included among the uh, femme forte of the Ancien Regime, for she was far from a likely candidate. I'll also assess why aristocratic women chose to present themselves as uh, en Cleopatra during, this, uh, during the era. And ultimately, I'll argue, Cleopatra served as an ambiguous exemplar of female heroism. She was, a, she was an alluring yet notorious figure associated with luxury, beauty, and seduction. She was both a, a femme forte and a, and a femme fatale. So while we in the 21st century audience might expect a painting of Cleopatra to, to depict one of two legends, um, smuggling herself into the palace in Alexandria wrapped in a carpet to meet Julius Caesar, or dying from the bite of an asp, lest she be taken captive by Octavian. We'd only be half right. Um, artists in the Ancien Regime did depict her death more frequently than any other episode. And some of those paintings are really quite eye-catching. Um, uh, but uh, they did not, as far as I can tell, depict uh, Cleopatra rolled up in the carpet ever. Um, some of these are not as eye-catching, uh, but um, give me the same, <laughs> it's the same picture, and you're like. <laughs> uh, but um, the second, second most uh, frequent depiction of Cleopatra refers to a part of her legend that's now just rarely told. And it shows Cleopatra as a beautiful woman en déshabillé, poised to drop a luminous pearl into a richly decorated chalice filled with wine. Now, paintings like these represent what was arguably the most well-known tale about Cleopatra in the pre-modern era. I mean, first recounted by Pliny the Elder in his first century Natural History, the tale was a strange and wondrous account describing how the beautiful Cleopatra won a bet with Mark Antony. So I have a passage um, that you may or may not be able to see. Uh, this is what Pliny had to say about it. The last of the Egyptian queens owned the two largest pearls of all time, left to her by Oriental kings. When Antony was stuffing himself daily with rare foods, she proudly and impertinently, like the royal harlot that she was, sneered at his attempts at luxury and extravagance. When he asked her what could be added in the way of sumptuousness, she replied that she would use up to 10 million sesterces, which is a lot of money, at one dinner. So they made a bet. And on the next day, she set before Antony a dinner that under any other circumstances would have been magnificent, but was an everyday affair for Antony. Antony laughed at her, but she said she would consume the 10 million sesterces dinner all by herself. Then she ordered the dessert to be served. And the servants placed but one dish before her, containing vinegar, in some stories it's, it's wine, which, um, containing vinegar whose acidity and strength dissolves pearls into slush. So while Antony was wondering what in the world she was going to do, she took one pearl from her ear, plunged it into the vinegar, and when it was dissolved, swallowed it. And so thus did the seductive, assertive Cleopatra outwit Antony and win her bet. And in case you are wondering, it is possible to deserve, <laughs> dissolve pearl earrings in vinegar. Uh -huh. It just takes a really long time. <laughs> uh, and there's still people who are, <laughs> there are still people who are trying to do it. So I didn't do this myself. This is just a screen capture. Uh, now, Pliny's strange and almost unbelievable account was repeated in works as varied as political tracts, dictionaries and scientific treatises over the following centuries. And it was a story just as frequently represented in art. Um, and I mean 
represented in art over and over. Um, the, the centuries that followed Cleopatra's um, suicide, the tale of her extravagant banquet was, was retold repeatedly, um, sometimes with incredulity and sometimes with wonder and inevitably with censure. And when I say it was told and retold and retold <laughs> and told some more and shown and depicted <laughs> and represented and portrayed <laughs> uh, and shown again because I'm out of um, um, I'm out of synonyms. Uh, uh, so told and retold and told again, and the story was told to demonstrate two particular dangers. Uh, that posed by luxury and excess, and that posed by female rule, whether that rule was over hearts or over kingdoms. In fact, one led inevitably to the other. So in book 10 of the Pharsalia, Lucan described uh, Cleopatra as a harmful beauty who was the shame of Egypt, the lascivious fury who was to become the bane of Rome. I mean, first she seduced Julius Caesar and then she aroused his greed, by which Lucan seemed to have meant his monarchical ambitions. Um, now after Caesar's death, Lucan said Cleopatra conquered Mark Antony and through him nearly conquered Rome. So the peril that she posed to patriarchal rule was clear, as he wrote, would a woman, not even Roman, rule the world? But the alluring Cleopatra not only ruled over Antony, she enslaved him. Uh, uh, in Boccaccio's Concerning Famous Women, uh, this is a 14th century work with almost a dozen editions in France before 1600, uh, Boccaccio portrayed Cleopatra as a depraved seductress driven by a lust for power. After acquiring, quote, her kingdom through two crimes, she gave herself to her pleasures, unquote. Um, her beauty and her wanton eyes ensured an easy conquest of this vile man, and she kept him miserably enthralled. As her insatiable craving for kingdoms grew day by day, she asked Antony for the Roman Empire, and Antony promised to give it to her as if it were his to give. Early modern plays such as uh, Jodel's Cleopatra Captive echoed Boccaccio's characterization, depicting a sensual Cleopatra who destroyed the honorable Mark Antony. And the hapless Roman proved powerless before Cleopatra, his passion for her having poisoned his soul. As the character of Antony proclaims, my eye too wanton was lost in the eyes of Cleopatra, not knowing then what extreme poison I had that day received in the deepest depths of myself. And she's often associated with poison because she um, allegedly poisoned her brother, um, Ptolemy IV. Now, political tracts such as uh, Jacques Olivier's um, Alphabet de l'Imperfection et Malice des Femmes reiterated the warnings about the threat posed by female rulers like Cleopatra. Cleopatra, he admonished, was, quote, a dangerous source of civil strife threatening the stability of kingdoms and the honor of men. Uh, that's 1617, by the way. For Olivier, the Egyptian queen was a powerful woman who unmanned virtuous men. She was, quote, not only a rock against which Mark Antony, the great and valiant captain, was broken and wrecked by her impure sensualities, but she was the cause of a thousand troubles and a thousand misfortunes among the Romans. In the middle of the century, Jean-Francois Seno agreed. Of Cleopatra's hold over Antony, he wrote, Quote, a man possessed by this infamous passion has neither reason or liberty, and as the slave of his love, he's no longer the master of himself. So Cleopatra here was an exotic foreigner who emasculated the leader of masculine Rome. So in this tradition, Cleopatra stood not only for the dangers of female rule over kingdoms and men, but also embodied luxuria an allegorical figure representing extravagance as well as worldly pride and depravity. And this tradition too originated in first century Rome. And the classical Roman authors were deeply suspicious of the East, labeling its peoples as corrupt and effeminate degenerates who chose to wallow in luxury and excess rather than embrace Roman rectitude. And for the Romans, no people wallowed with more abandon than did the Ptolemies. After all, the Romans could credit the tale of Cleopatra's pearl because they knew that she was incomparably wealthy, wealthier than anyone else in the ancient world. In the life of Antony, Plutarch described Cleopatra's opulent palace um, in Alexandria and detailed, this is luxuria actually, um, detailed uh, 
Its entrance hall paneled in ivory and gold, and its rooms replete with bronze couches, which never seem that comfortable to me, but are visually <laughs> stunning. Um, it was hung with elegant tapestries, and it was carpeted in roses and lilies. And Lucan, too, left a lavish description of the palace. And he wrote of alabaster and ebony floors, co um, ceilings covered in golden agate, door handles carved from ivory, and walls, walls swathed in purple brocade. And still other writers left uh, open-mouthed accounts of the Ptolemy's munificence. I mean, guests of the Egyptian rulers, who were ent entertained by hundreds at one meal, marveled at elaborate dishes served on gold and silver platters, and they departed laden with gifts that might include slaves, gazelles, horses, um, solid silver plate settings. So if Cleopatra drank off a priceless pearl to win a bet, it was an act in keeping with the Ptolemy's other scandalous extravagances. Yet despite the centuries-long literary tradition of condemning her wanton extravagance, licentiousness, and corruption of the most virtuous of men, the figure of Cleopatra had a persistent appeal in European art. Um, and indeed, it can be argued that the qualities for which he had been censured were the very ones that made posing on Cleopatra appealing to aristocratic women after the, you know, in the second half of the 17th century. Um, through the because of the power that she wielded through her magnificence and her beauty and her seductive allure. Uh, this chart, by the way, it's, uh, I know it's a bit of an art eye chart. Um, it's not mine, it's from a recent, a recent Belgian work. I think it's incomplete in terms of how many times these particular themes um, can be found in, in individual paintings. It does not include any portraits um, of, of aristocratic women or, or anybody posing as Cleopatra. These are just representations, um, artist models. Uh, but what you can see is that in the 17th century, this is really um, high points uh, for representing Cleopatra at all. And right here we have the pearl and the banquet hitting the high point as well. Uh, now, before Cleopatra could become a socially acceptable model for those who commissioned fashionable portraits, I want to argue her image had to be reimagined. I mean, there are paintings of Cleopatra, but not portraits as Cleopatra before 1661, or at least I haven't been able to find any. Um, that is, there, there are dozens of paintings depicting the famous episodes, disembarking from the ga her galley in Tarsus, holding her extravagant banquet, mourning at the tomb of Mark Antony, dying from the bite of an asp, I mean, there are also paintings of artists' models posing as Cleopatra holding a pearl and a goblet, but no individual noble women posed on Cleopatra before 1661. And I think this one of uh, Minette is the first, uh, at least the first that I can find. So what changed? Well, I want to argue that it's a two-step process of rehabilitation and domestication in which he came to be identified as both a, a femme forte and a paragon of female beauty. And I think it's her inclusion as a femme forte that opened up the possibility of recuperating her beauty and seductive powers and magnificence. And, and recuperating or rereading Cleopatra was made possible by the regencies of Marie de Penici and, and of Austria as well as the military exploits of prominent uh, frondeuses like the, like the Grande Mademoiselle. Um, these women, uh, these uh, noble women and, and rulers inspired <laughs> authors and artists <coughs> oh, <laughs> no worries, um, to reassess female political power and its re representations during the first half of the 17th century. And I don't mean to suggest that this is a universally positive reassessment. Um, the deeply misogynistic writings of Olivier and Sonneau that I quoted um, just now were published at the same time. But nonetheless, the, the genre of lives of illustrious women or the, the galleries uh, de um, dame forte that flourished at this time as authors and painters produced works that extolled the virtues of uh, heroic women. So many, uh, but not all, but many now numbered Cleopatra among the women worthies. Uh, Nicolas Prévost's cycle for the Chateau de Richelieu showed Cleopatra um, alongside Artemisia of Caria and, and Portia, among others. Uh, Madame de Scudery in included the Egyptian queen in her collection of Femmes Illustres, effectively recasting Cleopatra as a heroine fit to join the ranks of chaste wives and warrior queens and heroic widows. And 
Madame de Scudery celebrated her heroines for their uncommon virtue and their birth and their magnanimity. And according to the Salonier, Cleopat Cleopatra's uncommon virtue culminated in her noble suicide. I mean, first she saved Mark Antony um, by fleeing the Battle of Actium because she knew he would follow her and thus she saved his life. And then Cleopatra allowed, um, uh, rather than allowing Octavian to bring her back uh, to Rome in chains, Cleopatra committed suicide and thus preserved her honor. And her brave death was celebrated not only in, um, in pigment, uh, or sorry, it was celebrated in pigment as well as ink. Uh, the first half of the 17th century marks the, the high point of representations um, of Cleopatra's suicide. I'm just getting to the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, joining the ranks of the, the Femme Fort also allowed Cleopatra's association with Eastern luxury to be transformed into a, a more positive association, magnificence. And magnificence, for authors such as Pierre Lemoyne, was, was a virtue, a sort of force that allowed a Femme Fort to achieve her aims. In fact, a femme forte, if she was a public person, was required by her rank to be magnificent in all endeavors. It was a quality that particularly befit monarchs in an era when magnificence and display served a political function. So affluence, power, and legitimacy were inextricably bound together, both in the ancient world as well as in Ancien Regime Europe. And thus the tale of Cleopatra's pearl could be understood as the ultimate gesture of royal magnificence. Dissolving her earring in wine demonstrated that she disdained the wealth that she possessed. If she adorned herself with precious stones, it was meant to dazzle others, not herself. And in tossing away her priceless earring, um, she acted as a true ruler, one who remained unattached to material objects, which, whatever their value, served merely as tools. So, as inclusion among the femme fort rehabilitated Cleopatra's image, a new form of representation, I think, domesticated it. Um, first popularized in the princely courts of Italy, uh, galleries of beauties featured an array of identically composed portraits of the most beautiful noble women of the day. And the vogue for such collections soon spread through the royal courts and noble houses of Europe. Ostensibly, the galleries were assembled so that a viewer might come to mediate, meditate upon the virtues through a spiritual contemplation of beauty. But of course, more earthly concerns might also be involved. Um, in the late 1660s, Louis XIV commissioned the, the Bourbon cousins to paint a series for the royal apartments that included all of his female relatives, and that's kind of stretching the idea of beauty there, um, as well as the most beautiful women at court, um, several of whom became uh, his mistresses. So, um, now, arguably, the most renowned of the galleries of beauties, um, certainly the one most frequently copied, the, the portraits are copied um, uh, over and over, um, was painted by the Flemish Italian artist Jacob Ferdinand uh, Vogt, perhaps that's how you say it, um, for the Palazzo uh, di Chigi in Rome in the early 1670s. Now, like the sitters in Louis' collection, uh, Vogt's beauty um, evince no excessive or heightened emotion. They calmly offer themselves up to the viewer's gaze, appreciative gaze. And they're remarkably beautiful, but as they're dressed and posed and framed almost identically, they're nearly interchangeable. They're equally magnificent, but the allure that each individual woman might wield is, is visually contained. And this style of portraiture, I think, is at work to circumscribe the impact of the beauty of the individual sitters, along with Cleopatra's in incorporation into the femme forte, seems to have made it acceptable for noble women to represent themselves as the seductive Cleopatra. And we can see in one of the earliest portraits um, on Cleopatra, uh, also painted by um, Vogt, which is Marie Mancini right there. Um, the composition is remarkably similar to that of the beauties, uh, which she's also in. Um, and the only difference is the presence of the pearl um, in the latter. Uh, this Cleopatra, right, is not depicted as an alluring Egyptian queen or a passionate suicidal lover, but simply as a beautiful woman, one who's detached <laughs> from uh, any particular time and place. And the portrait's um, iconography alludes to, but doesn't depict her legend.
So the pearl is held in her fingers. There's no goblet, right? It just gestures towards Cleopatra's and hence the sitter's wealth and magnificence. It suggests Cleopatra's allure. I mean, 17th century audiences knew that pearls were associated with Venus and that Cleopatra's triumph over Mark Antony paralleled Venus's conquest over Mars, but none of that is rendered. But even so, to represent oneself as the seductive Egyptian queen um, did uh, require some daring in the last decades of the 17th century. I mean, Cleopatra was domesticated into a contemporary beauty, but noble women were far more likely to choose a less dangerous heroine, heroine and instead appropriate the imagery of a figure like Diana, um, god chaste goddess of the moon and the hunt for their portraits. And there are many, many pictures or portraits of um, on Dion. Now, women who chose to be portrayed as Cleopatra tended to allude to their own notoriety, whether that was earned for great wealth, great extravagance, great beauty, or all three. Uh, so, among the, uh, the um, votes Cleopatra's is a portrait of, of Marie Mancini, one of the famously beautiful, fabulously wealthy, and exceedingly notorious nieces of Cardinal Mazarin. And it's, she's the, the Marie, um, uh, Marie Mancini who's described in the Grand Dictionnaire des Précieuses as capable of reigning over the hearts of the most powerful princes of Europe. And that illusion wasn't lost on anybody in the 17th century. She was Louis XIV's first love, right? He fell in love with Marie, uh, and uh, they, they had a tragic breakup uh, instituted by Anne of Austria and Cardinal Mazarin because uh, uh, Louis XIV had to go marry the Spanish Infanta. Uh, he gave her, uh, Louis gave her a, a beautiful breakup gift, <laughs> this <laughs> necklace of pearls. Uh, there's some dis dispute over whether or not he also gave her these pearl earrings, sold not so long ago by Christie's for a quarter million dollars, by the way. Uh, um, but probably it was Anne of Austria who presented Murray with these. Um, so here she is with the pearls from Louis XIV afterwards. But so it's Murray and her Murray and her sisters, who are all sort of rather equally notorious, who choose to represent themselves as Cleopatra. Um, right? It, it just can't. Uh, um, uh, we should read this, I think, as a claim of the sitter's ability to captivate and manipulate the hearts and minds of men, willing or not. And, and contemporary viewers, too, would have been aware of the portrait's layers of meaning, which acknowledged the ancient tales told of the Egyptian queen, even as they gestured toward the notoriety and the reputation of the sitter. So when women such as the Mancini sisters chose to fashion themselves as Cleopatra, they didn't refer to merely one facet of her rich and multivalent legend. Um, they weren't the only um, ones. Uh, Louis XIV's legitimated daughters as well. So not just one facet of the legend, but rather referred to multiple mythologies. Cleopatra as femme forte, Cleopatra as conqueror of hearts, Cleopatra as magnificent queen. And the vocabulary of female heroism provided by the femme forte and that of female beauty um, contained within the boundaries limbed by the galleries of beauty uh, allowed them to do so. Thank you. <laughs>